this screencast, I want us to explore the relationship between karyotypes, meiosis, and monohybrid crosses. What you're looking at on the screen is a photograph taken of a human cell just prior to metaphase in mitosis. Um, at this point, of course, the, the DNA is condensed, it's coiled and supercoiled, and the chromosome's taken on that familiar X-shaped structure that we associate with a chromosome. Most of the time, of course, during the cell cycle, chromosomes, they don't look like this at all. What a karyotype is, is when we take a photograph like this and cut out each of the chromosomes and paste them onto a board according to their length. And what we find when we do that is that each of the chromosomes has a pair, or we call it a homologous pair or a homologue. Not only do they have the same length, but they have a few other features in common as well. If you have a look at chromosome three, for example, you'll notice that the centromere is right in the middle along the length of that chromosome. We would say that it's a metacentric chromosome. If you compare that to chromosome 13, you'll see that the centromere in that case is right up one end of the chromosome. We would say that chromosome 13 is an acrocentric chromosome. And there's all sorts of different variations in between. If you look at chromosome four, the centromere is about halfway between the center of the chromosome and the telomere or the end of the chromosome. We would say that chromosome four is a submetacentric chromosome. In any case, um, these homologous pairs can be paired up by their length, also by the centromere position. If we were to stain the chromosomes, we'd also see that they have a similar banding pattern. And most importantly, they have the same gene loci. In other words, if we look at chromosome three, if on this chromosome there was a gene at that locus for hair color, then there would also be the same gene on its homologue as well, a gene for hair color there as well. Now, when we talk about meiosis, very often I think when we're talking about this, we let ourselves get a bit confused by all the different phases of meiosis and the spindle fibers and all of that sort of stuff, which is of course all very interesting and very useful to know. But in this screencast, what I want us to do is, is really just distill our understanding of meiosis down and look at the, at the essential purpose of meiosis, which is to separate each of the pairs of chromosomes in this cell. We would say that this cell is a diploid cell. Each of the chromosomes has a homologous pair. And you'll see there that there are, there are 22 pairs of chromosomes, which we call autosomes. They're the same for both males and females. And then there's a pair of of sex chromosomes as well. In this case, one of the sex chromosomes is an X chromosome and one is a Y chromosome. That's because it's a male. If it was a female, there would be two X chromosomes. Nevertheless, we would say that this cell is a diploid cell. It has a pair of each chromosome type. What meiosis is all about is separating those pairs into two haploid cells. The whole idea of my meiosis, the whole purpose of meiosis is to produce haploid daughter cells. Of course, each of these cells would then further divide and the chromatids of each of those chromosomes is separated to give us two further cells. So we end up with four altogether. But it's this first division of meiosis that's really the critical one because it produces haploid daughter cells. And that's what meiosis is all about. If we look at just, let's just focus on one of the pairs of chromosomes. I want to look at chromosome 15. And the reason I've chosen chromosome 15 is because we know that on the long arm of chromosome 15, there's a gene that's responsible for skin pigmentation. When I was in Papua New Guinea, I took this photograph of a woman and her child who was an albino. Now, obviously, the, ch the woman isn't an albino. And uh, and so let's have a look at, at how we could do a simple monohybrid cross to work out what the chances are of a woman like this having a baby who is an albino. As I said, we know that the gene for albinism is found on the long arm of chromosome 15. And of course, if there's a gene at that locus on one of her chromosome 15s, then there must be a gene for skin pigmentation also on the homologue in, at the same locus because that's what it means for these chromosomes to be homologous. Just because they both have a gene for skin pigmentation though, doesn't necessarily mean they have the same allele 
of that gene. Now, an allele is a, a form of a gene, an alternate form of a gene, or if you like, a different version of the gene. So on one of these chromosome 15s, this woman has the allele for normal skin pigmentation. She must have because she has normal skin pigmentation. On the homologue, though, she has the allele for albinism. Now, this is it's still a gene, but the, but the, the pigment that it produces or the protein that it produces doesn't cause pigmentation of the skin. Nevertheless, she has you know, normally pigmented skin because on one of her chromosomes, she has that dominant A allele, the dominant capital A allele, which produces normal skin pigmentation. And you only need one of the genes to be producing the normal skin pigmentation for you to have normally pigmented skin. If you like, the effects of that little A allele are not shown if the other allele is producing brown pigment. And so we say that that albinism is a recessive trait because in order to have albinism, you need to have no alleles that produce normal skin pigmentation. In other words, you need to have a little a allele on both chromosomes and be homozygous for albinism. This woman though is heterozygous. She has one of each. Of course, each of these chromosomes has a sister chromatid and that sister chromatid will also have you know the same alleles because it's just a duplicate when when these when these chromosomes were duplicating themselves ready for mitosis when we took this photo um, this chromatid here or chromosome here duplicated itself to produce a sister chromatid which will also have a big a on it same here this one will have duplicated itself and have a sister chromatid that also has a little a on it but we would describe this woman's genotype as big A, little a. We wouldn't call her big A, big A, little a, little a. Because what when we say that her genotype is big A, little a, what we're saying is that half of her eggs will have a big A in them and half will have a little a in them. Um, you know, this, the, this, the eggs that are produced from, from this side are going to all have big A's in them. The eggs that are produced over this side from this daughter cell will all have a little a allele in them. So that's what it means when we say her genotype is big A, little a. It's, it's, it's important for you to be clear on that. We, we, we mean that half of her eggs will have a big A and half will have a little a. So when we come to doing a monohybrid cross, what we're saying is that, is that this woman will produce eggs, half of which will have a big A, half of which will have a little a. If we take her husband, her husband also has the genotype big A, little a, so half of his sperm will have a big A, and half of his sperm will also have a little a in them. And then it's just a matter, you know, what we're trying to do when we do a monohybrid cross is we're trying to work out what, what are the, the different genotypes that she can expect her children to have and what are the, the probabilities of each of those genotypes appearing amongst her children. So what we do is we say, well, if one of these sperm with a big A fertilizes one of these eggs with a big A, we're going to have a baby whose genotype is big A, big A. In other words, it's homozygous and it will have normal skin pigmentation. If one of these sperm fertilize one of these eggs, we're going to have a baby who is heterozygous. It will also have normal skin pigmentation because remember the little a is, or, or, or albinism is a recessive trait. You'd need to have two copies of the little a the allele for albinism in order to be an albino. Similarly, if this sperm fertilized this egg, we would end up with a baby who is heterozygous with normal skin pigmentation. But about a quarter of the time, if one of these sperm fertilized one of these eggs, we're going to get a baby whose genotype is little a, little a. And that baby will be an albino like we see he, here in, in the picture. So that's what a monohybrid cross is. Um, remember what we're writing across the top and down the side of this pedigree isn't really the genotype of these parents, but the gametes that they can produce, the proportion of gametes that they pr can produce. In this case, half of their gametes in each case will, will have the big A allele for normal skin pigmentation and half will have the allele 
for albinism.